Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Heavenly Father, we continue to learn much from the book of Joshua. Lord, show us today how, you know, the dividing up of the land began and all other kinds of details that you want us to see. Again, I ask that you would anoint my tongue to declare this word that you've given to me today. Declare it clearly so that everyone that hears it can understand it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we read of the conquest of the northern kingdoms. These fell just as easily as the kings and cities of the southern region because the Lord was with Israel to defeat these idolatrous kings and their people. It appears that what Jabin, king of Hazor, did is a tiny little glimpse of what will be happening when it comes time for the battle of Armageddon to be fought. Jabin gathered around together the kings and the armies of all of the surrounding cities to Merom. And we're told, so they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. You know, they could have been twice as many or even more than that, but they still were lost. They still would have lost because the Lord was fighting for Israel. When the time of the battle of Armageddon comes, we know that the kings of the entire earth, the kings of the whole world, are going to be gathering together to battle of the great day of the Lord, the great day of God Almighty. It is going to be a vast army. Nevertheless, that vast army, that horde, who is going to gather against the Lord will lose. The beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever, and the devil will be locked away in a pit for a thousand years. Today we are going to focus primarily on Caleb's inheritance and the inheritance which the descendants of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, received. Both are actually very interesting. I'm going to stop periodically to make comments. Just to give you a heads up so that your little calculating minds will be working. You know, we've been wondering how long it took for Israel to carry out the southern and the northern campaigns. By the time we get to verse 10 of chapter 14, we'll know. Because God gives us clues. In the first five verses of chapter 14, Joshua begins with some preliminary explanations before he addresses the territory that Caleb is going to receive. Joshua 14. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel, Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half-tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half-tribe on the other side of the Jordan, but the Levites he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were Manasseh and Ephraim, and they gave no part to the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Let's pause briefly here to remember what the Lord had said regarding the inheritance of the Levites. That references in Numbers 18, 19 to 21. 
It says all the heave offerings of the holy things, and a heave offering, you're heaving it before the Lord. All the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance, as a commandment forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. Let me explain what a covenant of salt is. We all know what those little salt shakers are, you know, that you get for picnics and so forth. All right? Um, everybody in Israel carried salt. For one thing, it was, a, it was a means of commerce, you know, trade. All right? Sometimes people were paid in salt, and certainly they preserved things in salt. But if you made a covenant of salt with somebody, you would take your two pouches of salt, or however many were in the covenant arrangement, you would take your pouches of salt, and you would pour them out all together, mix them all up, and then redivide them between all the parties in the covenant. The covenant of salt was this. If any one of those parties could divide out what their salt was, which particles, which grains belonged to them, then the covenant could be broken. Really. But the point being is that the covenant of salt was permanent. Because who's going to be able to divide those things out? Everything, if all the salt is white, all the salt is white. Okay? And I wouldn't want to even do it if there were blue grains and pink grains in there. It's like, I don't have that much time. All right? Okay. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. The Lord was their portion. There could be no better inheritance than the Lord. He says, well, behold, I've given the children of Israel all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance, as a possession, in return for the work that they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Okay? So they weren't going to be penniless. The tithes coming in would be distributed among them the Levites. Okay, having reviewed some of the preliminary agreements which had been made before Israel reached the promised land, let's move on to verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am. This day, 85 years old, as yet I am as strong this day as the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now it is strength. So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. How long? How long did the campaigns take? Y'all can do arithmetic, right? Especially the fifth grade teacher back there. Five years. 
Five years. Five years. Because he was 40 years old when he was sent out to spy out the land. There were 40 years of wilderness wandering. So when they crossed the Jordan River, he was 80. Now he's 85. Now somewhere in the, you know, it could have been, you know, right when he turned 85, he's making this statement, or right before he turns 86, but somewhere in there, you know, five to almost six years it took to take those kingdoms. Not really long, actually. So, but here's what I want to say about Caleb. Caleb is an amazing person, okay? What's he saying here to Joshua? He says, I am 85 years old, and just as my strength was when I was 40, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and coming in. Give me the territory where the giants are, and it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. God bless him. <laughs> I can just imagine... For more than 40 years as Israel, or you know, 40 years as Israel was wandering the wilderness, he's dreaming of driving out giants in the land. That's what he's doing. He's not going, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. He's saying, let me at them. <laughs> let me at them. I'll drive them out. If the Lord is with me, I will drive them out. Isn't that amazing? He's 85 years old. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. So now, isn't that an interesting piece of information? Caleb didn't want just any old piece of land where the giants dwelled. He wanted the territory where the greatest man among the Anakim dwelt. Caleb had chutzpah. All right, what's chutzpah? It means fearlessness. One definition I found for chutzpah was extreme self-confidence. I have to disagree with that regarding Caleb. Caleb's confidence wasn't in himself. It was in the Lord. It was in the Lord. Now let's read an excerpt from Joshua 15. We begin in verse 13. Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. You know why they keep repeating these things? Because originally a lot of this, you know, was memorized. And so when you repeat things, you have a better chance of remembering what you've heard. Now to Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Israel. Now Caleb is a descendant of Judah. All right. So they, to Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua. Namely, Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Sheshai, Ahanan, and Talmai, the children of Anak. Then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Deber. Formerly the name of Deber was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him, I'll give Aksa my daughter as wife. So Othnael, that's Caleb's nephew, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave Exa his daughter as wife. Now it was so, when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? She answered, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south. Give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. 
So what we hear in these verses is this, is that there, you know, the land is being divvied out, but there could be some additional negotiations made within the family to get specific pieces of land to go with their inheritance, or in this case, springs of water so that they've got a water supply. All right? Let's move on. We're going to go... Uh, excerpts from Joshua 16. Now we get to Manasseh. It took me the longest time to figure out that the half tribe of Manasseh wasn't like half Ephraim and half Manasseh and equals one tribe Joseph. That's only recent that the Lord finally got that arithmetic in my head. And part of that was because of the translation. But half the tribe of Manasseh and half the tribe of Manasseh equals one whole tribe of Manasseh. Joseph's descendants got two portions of the land, or in this case, three. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh. For he was the firstborn of Joseph, namely for Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore he was given Gilead and Bashan. And there was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh according to their families. But Zelophehad, the son of Hephir, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. And they came before Eleazar the priest, before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the rulers, saying, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among his father's brothers. Ten shares fell to Manasseh, besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. Jumping to verse 12, yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it happened. Now, I don't know why they couldn't do that, but... And it happened when the children of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Now Joseph's children are going to get into the act of negotiating. Let's see what they do. Then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, we, Why have you given us only one share, one lot, and one share of inheritance since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now? So Joshua answered them, if you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. But the children of Joseph said, the mountain country is not enough for us. And all of the Canaanites who dwell in the land of those valleys have chariots of iron both those who are of Beth Shen and its towns and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people and of great power. You shall not have only one lot, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you shall cut it down and its farthest extent shall be yours, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. Now we did skip some verses in that passage. I encourage you to read those at home, but mostly there's lots more details and lots more names, and it's like, okay. The point being made here is that negotiating for more land could be made. What is of additional interest to us here is though the children of Manasseh initially could not drive out the Canaanites, eventually they were able to put them to forced labor. Also, though the children of Ephraim and Manasseh argued their need for more land and Joshua told them that they could, what they could do to increase their allotment, Joshua also spoke a prophetic word to them when he told them that they would be able to drive out the Canaanites. 
even though they had iron chariots and were strong. Now this is how far we're going to go today. Before I end, I'd like to go back to Caleb. You know, I mentioned earlier that it's likely that he dreamt for 40 years, you know, while Israel was wandering in the wilderness. He was wanting to get at the giants. He wanted to drive them out of the land. He probably dreamt that he was doing it. He had the correct attitude. He said, give me the territory where the giants are, and it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. The point I want to make is this. Very soon, we're going to be facing some troubles in the earth, which have never, ever been experienced before. Jesus said that men's hearts will fail them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. Our prayer needs to be, oh, give us the hearts such as Caleb had, for he was not afraid of giants in the land. He knew that if the Lord was with them, he would be able to take them on and drive them out, and he did. At this particular moment, we don't know exactly what giants we're going to be facing. We do know this, though. God hasn't changed. He is the same now as he was when Caleb lived. If God is with us, no giant will be able to defeat us. This is the wonderful promise that we have from God's word today. Amen.